Welcome everyone who's joined us today for the AI Hub AI for Healthcare webinar. Um, so my name is Steph and I'm the Industry Partnerships Manager for the MedTech sector of the AI Hub um, and excited to have our first um, AI for Healthcare webinar in this series. So we will be um, every month having different webinars with different speakers talking about AI for healthcare and the different issues and topics surrounding that. Um, today will be an excellent first webinar if, if you're just new to the field and if not there's lots of great information for you here. We're lucky to have a number of brilliant minds from the CSIRO Australian eHealth Research Centre um, to speak with us today. Um, so they have recently released a report called Exemplars of Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning in Healthcare, Improving the Safety, Quality, Efficiency and Accessibility of Australia's Healthcare System. So the link to this white paper will be linked below if you want to have a read of it. Um, it's an excellent read and it's very readable if you're not deeply immersed in the field. It's a great introduction to help you understand some of the issues around this and give you some examples of the possibilities. So I recommend definitely having a look at that. Um, so today we have with us David Hansen, who is the CEO of the Australian eHealth Research Centre. And he will be giving a presentation. He'll be sharing some videos as well um, that go over some of the content of this white paper, which will be really interesting. Following that, we'll then open up to a Q&A to all our panelists. So on our panel today, we have as well, Bevan Koopman, who is the Senior Research Data Scientist, uh, Sam Kalp Kanna, Research Team Leader of Health Intelligence, Xing Zhang, Research Team Leader in the Health Internet of Things, uh, Natalie Twine, Team Lead and Genomics Data Scientist, Kirsten Panic, Senior Research Scientist. Dennis Bauer, Head of Cloud Computing and Bioinformatics. Anthony Nguyen, Team Leader for Natural Language Processing. And Michael Lawley, Group Leader for Health Informatics. So um, feel free to type in any questions in the question and answer box as David is presenting. And then after that, we'll open up the panel and um, hopefully we can answer as many questions as possible. So without further ado, I'll hand over to David. Go for it. Fabulous. Thanks, Steph, and thanks everyone for uh, joining the, the uh, webinar today. Uh, as Steph mentioned, we've recently released a report. It's on our website and the, um, and the URL is there in the chat. Uh, as part of that, um, we'll, we'll also be releasing a number of uh, videos. So the report takes the form of uh, 34 case studies as well as a primer. I'll dive into that in a moment. Um, uh, and so we're getting our scientists for, to record short videos about, the, about each of the case studies, uh, as well as a, a primer. And we're going to be making those available uh, through various social media. So look out for those. Uh, and today we're, I'm gonna give a very short uh, presentation and then we'll um, dive into some of those videos. Everyone who's, who's made, a, 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 who, whose video we're showing is on the panel today. So uh, more than happy to take questions for any of them uh, at the end, but we, we do have seven videos. They're four to five minutes each. Um, uh, and, and so uh, we'll, um, but, but they give you a real flavor of what we cover in the report. So let me just tell you a bit about us. I'll share my presentation. Um, And um, okay, and then I think uh, I should be. Oh, where's the presentation? Okay, so I should be sharing the presentation now. So, so we are uh, the Australian Health Research Centre. Um, uh, <coughs> Uh, CSRO's Digital Health Research Program. Um, but we started out in Queensland uh, before expanding nationally around, uh, around Australia. And, and we've been around for a while. So we, we, we're Australia's first and largest e-health research hub. Uh, we opened in 2003, um, initially with funding from the Queensland Government, uh, and that expanded into Queensland Health and now we, uh, our partnership is with Queensland Health here in Queensland. Um, but we've had additional investment from CSIRO to grow around Australia. And now we're over 100 scientists and engineers, uh, as well as over 30 students in Brisbane, Perth, Sydney and Melbourne. Our real aim is to provide an evidence base for the digital transformation of healthcare. And, um, and, and we hope that the AI report that we've um, published uh, clearly demonstrates that deep domain knowledge that we have in the team, as well as deep digital knowledge that, um, uh, and, and expertise that we have. 
Uh, our success has been built on our partnerships with government, clinicians, industry, SMEs, and, and a whole heap of other, other people. Uh, so what do we do? Um, we like to talk about science with impact and we, we are across three broad areas, biomedical informatics, so that's biostatistics, imaging, genomics, uh, based clinical workflows. And today you'll, there'll be two, uh, two talks from that area. Uh, we have got Kirsten talking about one of our imaging projects, or three actually, and then Dennis and, um, and Natalie talking about uh, genomics uh, and our cloud computing uh, work uh, in our health informatics work, which is about improving health system performance and productivity from electronic health data. Uh, there we have Bevan, Sankalp and, um, and Michael talking about uh, our projects in our health services, which really covers mobile health, telehealth, the health internet of things. Uh, we've got Ching talking about one of our uh, technologies there. Oops. Uh, so, um, and, and this is an image out of the report, uh, really showing that we use AI right across the spectrum of health, um, health uh, areas of health, right from bioinformatics and cells, right through to population health and society. Uh, and so whether that's processing and extracting information out of, out of genomic data or, or medical imaging data, helping um, our, our health system collect really good data that, that is suitable for artificial intelligence, and machine learning, all right through to processing of, um, of, of sensor data, either from uh, wearable devices or from sensors um, in, the family, uh, in, in the family home. So uh, we do a whole range of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, and this is something we were trying to get across in the report, that, um, uh, that AI and ML isn't new. Um, there's certainly some great stuff that, that things like cloud computing and the increased in, increase in data uh, capture in the health system allows, but a lot of these uh, technologies uh, have been around for many years, but are really being beefed up at the moment. So the report um, and the URL is, is on the screen as well as in the chat. Um, we start off with a primer, uh, kind of explaining, uh, and so it's really an introduction to artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, <clears throat> and that's a great opportunity. That'll be the first video that we do post, um, in, uh, probably on LinkedIn and YouTube, uh, and we almost played that one today, but we made the late decision not to. Um, it's, a, it's an introduction. Bevan does a great job of explaining um, the, the kind of breadth of technologies that artificial intelligence and machine learning um, makes up. Uh, the report then, then takes on 34 case studies uh, and really across four different areas, data-driven intelligence, imaging and vision, knowledge representation and reasoning, and human understanding. And they're really our focus domains uh, that we've built our, our case studies around. Just to, just, you know, the, there's lots of different ways of looking at the world of artificial intelligence. Uh, and this is the way that many reports are actually starting to look at, at artificial intelligence and, and that's the way we are looking at it. Um, we also in the report talk about symbolic AI versus statistical AI. Um, I, I think with the increase in compute power, uh, we hear a lot about machine learning and, and the use of statistical AI, um, but there's, there's, there's still a very strong flavor in the work we do around symbolic AI, AI, so representing human knowledge into known facts or rules. And that'll come through in one or two of the talks that we have today. Uh, and then in terms of machine learning, we've got classification versus regression, supervised and unsupervised and deep learning. And Bevan goes into some great uh, detail in the, in the primer video, which again, we'll put out uh, in the next 24 hours on, um, on how we, uh, on those different sorts of machine learning. So, so look, the, the report's about 100 pages. Um, it's I've got a uh, chock full of, of information. I do want to recognise the, the people who, do, who contributed to the report, uh, particularly Dan and Bevan, who worked with me in uh, pulling it all together, but al also our case study authors, Dennis, um, uh, Justin, uh, uh, actually, I won't read them all out, but they're all there and they've all done a fabulous job in um, pulling those together. Um, so, so thank you very much for, um, uh, for that. Uh, and, and I think we, um, we'll, we, we might get started with our first, um, first video.
Before I do, and, and apologies that I, I, I neglected to uh, just recognise the um, traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting today and, and pay our respects to uh, elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and here in Brisbane, where many people are, are based, that is the Turrbal and Jagara people um, <coughs> and their leaders. So, um, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, play the videos. Uh, there will be a small gap as I move between each video. I didn't quite get them all streamed together, um, but I think this is a great introduction, um, both to the sort of information that we have throughout the report, um, we will be making five short uh, videos on all our case studies, um, which we'll be putting up over the next few months. So it's a great, um, great opportunity uh, to hear the scientists talk about their videos. So first up, we have Dennis, um, and I will just share the video. And here we go. Artificial intelligence and machine learning have been around for decades. So why is it that there's such an excitement around this technology today? Let's find out with the Artificial Intelligence Report from the Australian eHealth Research Centre. My name is Dr. Dennis Bauer, and with more than 15 years experience in machine learning, I've seen most of the successful algorithms today having been around for decades. The difference now? The datafication of everything means there is more data available than ever before. This leads to better accuracy and with it more trust in the technology. But there is one other crucial development that has amplified the capability of machine learning like no other. Cloud computing. The availability of vast compute resources from public cloud providers means more complex models can be trained in minutes rather than days. This is enabled by new distributed computing approaches which allow the commodity hardware of public cloud providers to be used for massively parallel yet robust processing of data. However, machine learning is an iterative process that requires information to be kept in memory between each iteration step. With the early distributed computing systems like MapReduce unable to cater for this requirement, it took until the development of Apache Spark for machine learning to fully benefit from distributed computing and the capability of the cloud. Since in place though, the resulting Spark-based machine learning library MLlib has seen many machine learning algorithms be re-implemented in this high-performance framework. Yet there are still areas where the scalability of Spark's MLib is not sufficient, in particular in the health space. Here, the number of features, that is the information points per sample or patient, can quickly grow into the millions and exceeds the capability of even MLlib. For example, in the human genomic space, the mutational profile of a patient can contain more than 80 million features. To process this kind of data, algorithms that are purpose-built for the ultra-high dimensional health space are necessary. At the Australian eHealth Research Centre, we have created VariantSpark, which is an adaptation of the random forest algorithm. VariantSpark is able to handle millions of samples with millions of features each to detect disease genes and lead to better diagnostics. And be sure to check out the variant spark case study in the report. <laughs> Other than providing unprecedented processing power, cloud computing has also accelerated the uptake of machine learning. New cloud native architectures offer economical yet highly scalable infrastructures, which is perfect for serving out the prediction of machine learning models. These so called serverless approaches allow individual elements like compute, storage, and communication to be decomposed into modular services, each of which able to scale to massive workloads, but they only incur cost when actually in use. This enables the design of very powerful compute services without breaking the bank. At the Australian eHealth Research Centre, 
We have created several serverless web apps that use machine learning to predict biological results from user-provided data. For example, our serverless variant effect predictor can predict the functional outcomes of a single misspelling in the DNA and is powerful enough to process all three billion letters in the human genome. Be sure to check out the serverless variant effect prediction case study in the report. To summarize, cloud computing has amplified the capability of even decade-old machine learning algorithms by providing the computational power and economic delivery vector to bring machine learning to the front line and into clinical practice. Download the report today for more insights into using artificial intelligence and machine learning for health applications. Read exciting case studies from Australia's largest in eHealth Research Centre and get in touch with us to discuss collaborations. Did you know that diagnosing genetic diseases can be improved by knowing who your distant relatives are? Find out how the Australian eHealth Research Centre uses machine learning to connect family trees in motor neuron disease patients. My name is Dr. Natalie Twine and I lead the Genome Insights team at CSIRO. Together with Macquarie University, we are part of a five-year NHNMRC grant to understand the genetic basis of motor neuron disease, also known as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Now, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, is a devastating neurodegenerative disease which has no known treatment and leads to death within two years of diagnosis. Our team have been responsible for the analysis of the 800 Australian ALS genomes, as well as 22,000 genomes from the largest international ALS consortium, Project MINE. We have utilized our cutting edge technology, Variant Spark, a machine learning approach which uses random forest to identify genetic drivers of disease. Now, crucially, Variant Spark can identify genetic variants that are interacting with each other to cause disease, a feature which is really essential for analyzing such complex disorders such as ALS. With Variant Spark, we have identified a potentially novel ALS disease gene active in the Australian population, and we are currently working with Project Mind to apply our technology to their 22,000 ALS case control cohort. We have also tried a novel angle to understand the genetics of ALS by applying our innovative ancestry platform, Tribes, to identify relatedness in Australian ALS patients. In doing so, we have uncovered 54 hidden relationships between patients. Now, you may wonder how ancestry can help us discover the genetic cause of ALS. Well, these hidden relationships have enabled us to substantially narrow the search space for the genomic origin of ALS, including identifying new candidate ALS genes, FIG4 and APOE. This work has also enabled us to connect 19 distinct ALS families, all sharing known ALS gene SOD1, which was recently published in Nature's Genomic Medicine Journal. Over the last years, our collaborative research on ALS has had direct impact in both the research and translational areas, including a publication in the high-profile journal called Cell Neuron. Ultimately, though, novel genetic triggers identified by both tribes and variant SPARC will result in new therapeutic candidates and enable earlier clinical intervention, leading to improved life ex expectancy for all ALS patients. Download the report today for more insights into using artificial intelligence and machine learning for health applications. Read exciting case studies from Australia's largest digital health initiative, the Australian eHealth Research Centre and get in touch with us to discuss collaborations. In a multi-residential smart environment, individual identification is one of the most critical issues in order to realize the full functionality and potential of the smart home platform's personalized service. This case study demonstrates how we develop an AI-powered solution to support a multi-residential home environment.
My name is Dr. Ching Zhang, and I lead the Health Internet of Things team at CSRO. Together with the CSRO Energy and Data 61, we are focusing on developing new, non-variable, privacy-preserving human identification sensors for smart home platform. Through using ultra wideband radar technology. The smart home analyzes data from sensors deployed in the home environment to measure a person's activity of daily life and provide the necessary support. This approach works well when there is only one person living alone. However, in homes with multiple residents, activity identification models designed for single person living environments do not produce satisfactory results because it is difficult to know whose data the sensors are capturing. There are usually two methods of indoor human identification. Computer vision system is one, however, there have poor performances in low visibility conditions and they inevitably raise privacy concerns. Another is the use of variable devices. However, this requires the resident to always wear or carry devices throughout the day which prevents them from being widely accepted by older communities, let alone those with neurodegenerative diseases. At the Australia eHealth Research Center, we have developed a new artificial intelligence-driven identification sensor. Compared to existing approaches, this is a non-variable, privacy-protected sensor, which is the size of a credit card and can be easily deployed on the ceiling of the home. As you can see in this slide, this sensor uses ultra-wideband or UWB radar technology. UWB radar systems can be installed in indoor environments in a non-intrusive manner and offer many advantages such as high resolution rate, low power cost, and strong resistance to narrowband interferences. When residents passing through the detecting zone under our sensor, the reflected data collected by UWB sensor is a high-frequency, time-series data stream. The artificial intelligence component in the sensor unit then appropriately process and analyzes the received UW radar signal to ext extract unique features and patterns of each residence and to identify them. So this process begins by visualizing the sensor data as a heat map using a bandpass filter as shown in this slide. The UW signal scatters from different parts of the body at different times with different amplitude, depending on the distance to the body parts as well as the size and material of the reflective part. In this slide, you can see examples of scattered signals of two different subjects walking near the UW radar. With different walking patterns, the brighter the color indicates the closer the sensor is to the target. Since the two subjects are different in height and size, the reflected signal from them as they pass by the UW radar will result in different heat map. The artificial intelligence component of our identification sensor will then extract the feature of the heat map patterns of individual residents and use the trained neural network models to identify the individuals. We use a 16 layer convolutionary neural network to train our sensor model. Preliminary experiment results show that this new sensor has high recognition accuracy of over 90% in distinguishing between 14 individuals in an indoor environment. This identification sensor is compatible with CSRO's Smart Safer Home platform. It will help to extend this platform to a wider range of applications to support more elderly Australians who prefer to age at home. This novel sensor provides a simple and reliable solution to ensure smart homes' performance in a multi-residential environment. It is an environmental sensor, but it is also protects residents' privacy. The sensor works on battery and can be deployed in the home easily. With the sensor, many existing smart home platforms that support independent living can be easily scaled up to support multiple residential environments. Download the report today for more insights into using artificial intelligence and machine learning for health applications. Read exciting case studies from Australia's largest digital health initiative, the Australian eHealth Research Centre, and get in touch with us to discuss collaborations. 
Our health system has to respond to crisis situations time to time. Some of these are seasonal surge events like the flu season every winter and some are once in a lifetime events like the current COVID-19 pandemic. We have effectively used artificial intelligence powered solutions to help the health system respond to such crisis situations. My name is Dr. Sankalp Khanna and I lead the health intelligence team at CSIRO. My team is focused on helping increase health system productivity and safety, improving patient flow and developing administrative and clinical decision support solutions. Our health system already operates under pressure. When extra pressure comes along in the form of surge in cases, it overburdens the system, sometimes to near breaking point. The system needs to perform very efficiently so that there is minimum impact on business as usual activities such as elective surgery. And there are pandemics such as the one we are facing right now where business as usual comes to a halt and the system is in uncharted waters and it needs to monitor what is happening and respond very quickly to what can be a rapidly changing crisis. Our response to this has been to work very closely with the health system and with colleagues from Cyrus Data 61 business unit to develop data driven solutions that can inform and support the health system in responding to the crisis at hand. We have used predictive models to inform planning and preparedness and a combination of surveillance, predictive modeling and simulation modeling to inform response, recovery and resilience efforts. Predictions from the patient admission prediction tool, a capacity management solution developed by our team have been used effectively to inform planning and deployment of services for the annual schoolies activity on the Gold Coast. We have also combined these with other analytics to support Queensland government's winter wet planning effort, to predict demand over winter months under various scenarios, and to predict capacity shortfall and quantify the impact of winter on statewide hospital bed planning. We have worked with Queensland Health to develop a suite of syndromic surveillance algorithms originally in response to the 2009 swine flu influenza outbreak and following on from there to inform planning for annual flu outbreaks. These algorithms monitor the time between events as a trigger for outbreak detection and have proven to be quite responsive in signaling, in signaling an outbreak. More recently, as you would expect, a lot of the effort has been focused on, COVID on the COVID-19 crisis. In addition to building a COVID dashboard, to support state and federal organizations in responding to this crisis, we have worked with a number of state health agencies to support their work in developing models of the impact of COVID-19 on their health services. We worked with Queensland and New South Wales Health to provide expert advice on their forecasting models and with SA Health to develop syndromic surveillance algorithms for early detection of future outbreaks and other pandemics. We are also working with Queensland Health on a project called the COVID Barometer. We bring together data routinely collected and analyzed in isolation by different agencies. There's data from public transport and road use, mobile phone movement across cell towers, spending data from Treasury, and health-related data um, related to COVID, health system capacity, and information uh, of vulnerable populations. And we feed that into various AI techniques for surveillance, forecasting, and decision-making. This creates a platform to understand, at the population level, the changes to our health and behavior over time, and tells us how we, as a population, are adapting to the surreal and rapidly changing environment. It allows us to quickly identify where we need to act or respond, empowers us with the information we need to plan our response, and allows us to monitor the impact of our response. All of the solutions we have developed have a common theme, and that is empowering the health system in dealing with the crisis at hand. Insights from the data, predictions from the machine learning models, and scenario-based planning from the simulation models, all of these help the health system prepare and quickly respond so that they can deliver best possible outcomes for the patient population and the healthcare workforce. For example, Understanding the predicted demand and identifying capacity shortfall periods for the upcoming winter months helped hospitals ensure system readiness and to cater for the surge in demand from flu cases with minimum impact on the rest of their activities.
Similarly, the COVID barometer allows the health system to monitor what's happening out there and respond quickly. In the case of an outbreak, we can identify vulnerabilities and focus available resources. This might mean additional testing for certain regions or redeployment of staff to particular areas. As these AI-assisted solutions prove their efficacy at making the health system more resilient, they will become a part of the business as usual. Today, the COVID barometer is being used to navigate this current pandemic for COVID-19 related monitoring and decision making as we strive efforts are being made to return to normal. Eventually, this will evolve into a population health barometer to inform system readiness, response and resilience during future crisis scenarios through a better understanding of the differential impact of the crisis, especially on vulnerable populations. Download the report today for more insights into using artificial intelligence and machine learning for health applications. Read exciting case studies from Australia's largest digital health initiative, the Australian eHealth Research Centre, and get in touch with us to discuss collaborations. Automated reasoning with formal logic has long been a major component of artificial intelligence research. In this case study, we'll see how technology from the Australian eHealth Research Centre is making its application more practical. Hi, my name is Dr. Michael Lawley and I lead the Health Informatics Group at the Australian eHealth Research Centre. We apply both statistical and symbolic AI techniques to improve health data quality so that we can get the best healthcare outcomes relying on this data. When clinicians record data about a patient, symptoms, a diagnosis, prescribed medications and procedures, they need to be precise and unambiguous so that computer algorithms can perform accurate analytics or provide trustworthy clinical decision support. To this end, a controlled vocabulary is used where each idea or concept is given a unique code. SNOMED CT is the most comprehensive international standard and currently consists of about a half million such codes. Furthermore, these codes are cross-linked to capture the relationships that exist between the different concepts so that computers can reason about them consistently. You can see a small part of this hierarchy, shown here horizontally, along with a representation of the relationships for fracture of lower leg. How does this all work? Let's look at, it, at an example set of concepts representing parts of the anatomy, body structure, lower limb and tibia, as well as fracture, a type of disorder. These concepts are connected by is ages, representing specialization. Now, if we consider a lower limb disorder, we can see it is a disorder and it is linked to the lower limb concept. We can now define fracture of lower limb as being both a fracture and a lower limb disorder. It is then possible to automatically infer that the site is the lower limb. Furthermore, we could define fracture of tibia as being a fracture located in the tibia, and then automatically infer that fra fracture of tibia is a fracture of lower limb. These definitions, when expressed formally, use a branch of logic called description logic. For SNOMED CT, there are definitions, or axioms, for every one of the half million concepts, and these can all interact, allowing new relationships to be inferred. Reasoning with this many axioms can take a long time without the right algorithm. At CSIRO, we developed the world's fastest automated reasoner, Snorricut, for processing a sub-branch of description logic suitable for defining clinical concepts. Snorricut reduced the processing time for SNOMED CT from more than 30 minutes down to under two minutes, and for the first time introduced an incremental mode that processed changes in seconds. It also allowed for more detail to be expressed in a concept's definition. This was sufficient to change the SNOMED CT authoring and maintenance process from a batch activity where a large set of changes was made before the impact was checked to an online activity where small sets of changes could be processed in semi-real time. By profoundly reducing the cost of the authoring and maintenance process, we have enabled a significant improvement in the quality of concept definitions. By increasing the available expressive power of the description logic, we have enabled more precise definitions of concepts, 
especially in the area of medications, where reasoning about numbers, such as strengths and quantities, is particularly important. Snow Rocket was the foundation and catalyst for our terminology server, Onto Server, which is licensed internationally and is the foundation of Australia's National Clinical Terminology Service. You can explore some HCT in all its detail using our browser, Shrimp. Download the report today for more insights into using artificial intelligence and machine learning for health applications. Read exciting case studies from Australia's largest digital health initiative, the Australian eHealth Research Centre, and get in touch with us to discuss collaborations. Have you ever done a Google search where you really struggled to formulate the right query keyword? Now imagine the situation where formulating a good quality query has real implications for medicine or public policy. This is the case for people searching for studies when conducting a systematic review. My name is Dr. Bevan Koopman and I lead the health search team. A systematic review is extensive study compiling all evidence around a particular topic. Think do antimalarial drugs help treat coronavirus? Compiling a systematic review is a laborious and costly process that involves searching and manually reviewing potentially hundreds of thousands of research articles. It all begins and it all depends on being able to formulate good search queries for your research question. For systematic reviews, people have to formulate complex multi-statement queries. For example, COVID or coronavirus and malaria or mosquito-borne diseases. This project aims to devise AI-based query formulation methods, helping people write and understand better search queries. A number of AI-based methods were developed. In the first instance, we take someone's query and we generate a more effective query. This is done through a query chain transformation model. This model takes a searcher's initial query and applies a series of semantic transformations such as adding new search terms, changing Boolean clauses and broadening or narrowing the search scope. Queries can be presented to the user for explainability or automatically applied. Using this model, we can generate millions of different queries. These synthetic queries can then be evaluated and used as training data for a new machine learning model that learns to predict what a good query looks like, essentially a query performance predictor. This has two use cases. First, when someone enters a new query, the query performance predictor can give them some quantitative measure of how good their query might be. Second, we can use the query performance predictor to automatically choose the best query from the millions of synthetic queries we generate from the query chain transformation. Finally, we have developed new natural language processing and search methods that actually forego the need for people to manually author their queries and instead, we generate them directly from the initial research question for the systematic review. This method takes the initial research question, say, do antimalarial drugs help treat coronavirus, and identifies the different key parts contained in it. So the part for antimalarial drugs and the part around coronavirus. This is actually akin to the recommended practice for how people manually formulate their queries. From these different parts, we then generate the terms to search on. We do this with a model that captures the meaning behind the terms, thus generating queries which would cover the different ways of expressing something. So for coronavirus, COVID, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, etc. Finally, at the end of the process, we generate a final query to search for literature. The above methods have been packaged up as a set of software tools that also include useful visualization and exploration tools so users can better understand both their queries and the search results. 
The tools are now being used by researchers at Bond University's Institute for Evidence-Based Healthcare as part of a number of important systematic reviews that they are conducting. The advantage of these methods are both better search results and less manual review. The outcome of this is higher quality and less costly systematic reviews, which are crucial to both clinical practice and public policy. Thank you. Download the report today for more insights into using artificial intelligence and machine learning for health applications. Read exciting case studies from Australia's largest digital health initiative, the Australian eHealth Research Centre, and get in touch with us to discuss collaborations. Imagine being told that your child is at high risk of serious long-term disability, but you have to wait months or even years before you receive a proper diagnosis and even longer for intervention. This is the heartache parents of very preterm babies face every day in Australia. At the Australian eHealth Research Centre, we're using machine learning to find ways to diagnose babies at high risk of cerebral palsy soon after birth. My name is Kirsten Panek and I'm a senior research scientist in the Neurodevelopment and Plasticity team and an expert in brain MRI in babies. Together with the University of Queensland and Monash Health, we are part of one of the world's largest cohort studies of preterm babies, with the aim of using early MRI to predict outcomes such as cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy, or CP, is a lifelong physical disability that is caused by abnormal brain development or brain injury during pregnancy or early in life. Every year, more than 400 babies and children in Australia are diagnosed with CP. The brain is most likely to respond to interventions to help reduce the severity of disability between the ages of birth and two years, but the average age of diagnosis is about 18 months. So we're missing that really important window where intervention can make the biggest difference. Our team has been responsible for analyzing early brain MRIs of around 300 very preterm babies who are at high risk of CP, so that in the future, babies can be identified much earlier. We do these MRIs without using sedation while the babies are sleeping. So one of the problems we have immediately is that babies often wake up and move, which corrupts the images. To overcome this problem, we develop machine learning methods that can detect and then correct the corrupted images. This will allow us to use a lot of the data that would otherwise not be usable. We then use these MRIs to calculate brain images that allow us to quantify the baby's brain development. Here you can see one of the images we calculate. Using tractography, we are able to visualize the connections in the baby's brain completely non-invasively, without injecting any dyes or other substances. Recently, we used deep learning to predict a baby's motor outcomes from brain MRI acquired very early in life. Babies in this study were born up to 16 weeks early and we used brain MRI from when they were 2 days to 10 weeks old. Using our approach, we were able to predict the baby's motor outcomes at 2 years with high accuracy. Here you can see which regions of the brain were associated with adverse outcomes. These regions are also known to play important roles in motor function. This work and other work that we did using this data has been published in high-profile journals, including NeuroImage and NeuroImage Clinical. We are now implementing our tools in Cyrus Milk's Cloud. Milk's Cloud is a web interface that provides automated reports of biomedical imaging data. This will allow researchers worldwide to upload their MRIs of preterm-born babies and receive a PDF report detailing quantitative markers of the baby's brain development. At the moment, these tools are for research use only. They can be used to gain a better understanding of brain development in general, but they can also be used to recruit the right babies into clinical trials of new early interventions. Ultimately though, we plan to make these tools available for clinical use. 
This will help provide a diagnosis and prognosis much earlier than the current standard. This means parents can get answers sooner and children will be able to start interventions when their brains are most receptive. This could lead to a reduced severity of disability and better quality of life for the children and their families. Download the report today for more insights into using artificial intelligence and machine learning for health applications. Read exciting case studies from Australia's largest digital health initiative, the Australian eHealth Research Centre, and get in touch with us to discuss collaborations. Okay, so um, thank you all. Uh, I, hope, I hope you found those um, talks from, from seven of our, our scientists uh, interesting and, and some, um, uh, and, and you got to hear about some of the AI and applications that we're building. Um, so, so look, that's Steph, that's where, um, they, they're the videos that we've uh, shown today. Um, plenty more to come. Uh, we've got 34 case studies as well as some boxes and the primer, which we'll be making videos of. So keep an eye out for those, but uh, open for questions now. We've got all of the scientists that presented today, plus one or two more uh, on, the, on, the, um, on the video conference. Excellent. So it looks like we've got one question there. Um, First question is, much of this research is impressive. What are the key impediments to deliver this to the bedside to improve clinical outcomes? Um, so look, that's a, it's a great question um, because uh, that, that is, of course, what we're, we're trying to do. Uh, and that very much depends on the technology. So, so at the moment, the, the um, PGA is, is currently re reviewing their um, uh, software as a medical device regulations um, uh, with a view to how to uh, how to regulate digital health interventions and they'll very much you know uh, we think we've, we've been involved in um, providing some feedback um, uh, but they will very much stick to to the same sort of um, medical device uh, usual medical device guidelines as to whether a clinical an automate a clinical decision without a human in the loop is is being um, uh, is being developed. So I think there's a there's a bunch of things we can do to make sure that um, uh, that uh, we're, we're building our solutions and collecting the evidence that they um, that they work and that they make a difference to the healthcare system. Uh, and and then it's a matter of working with the healthcare system uh, through appropriate channels to um, to to drive usage. So um, yes, no no easy answer, I'm afraid, um, but lots of work and 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 fun stuff to do. Uh, Wade's after, and, and Ching, I think this might be a question for you. So UWB is the vehicle for individual gait tracking. Um, do you want to comment on that? Ching, Ching, Ching you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, yeah, so the UW sensor has been a lot of uses. So, um, especially, say, for example, in our in our UW sensor, we actually collaborated with Cyro Energy Department, and what they use is similar to the vehicle things, but they use it under the under mine to to search for people. So, but we actually taking the UW sensor and minimize it to a small credit card size. And what we want is that we want to analyze the raw radar signals and use that to distinguish the um, different persons in the smart home. So this is a this is important component. To support our smart home platforms that can that can support in the senior livings while not asking the seniors to wearing any wearable sensors, provide a lot of convenience for them. Excellent. So I actually have a question. Um, so you mentioned David about human in the loop, and um, obviously all of these these techniques you need to validate and, and train these models. Um, and I'm assuming for most of them you would need a human in the loop. Um, I guess the question applies to everyone, but we don't have time for everyone to answer. Um, so, Michael, I was interested in uh, the tool you mentioned. I understand how painful systematic reviews can be and how important this kind of tool would be. Um, so, how do you, how is this training sort of um, done with this tool? Bevan, I think that might be a question for you. Oh, sorry, that was Bevan. Yep, yep. sure, sure. Um, yeah, so that that's that is definitely a situation where the the searcher is uh, integral, right? So they, it's not a it's not a um, a process that 
um, works without the person um, being able to um, interact with the system and select what information they're looking for and what they're interested in. Um, in terms of the training, there is an offline machine learning method that trains the model um, up to a certain state. But then at the same time, there's an interactive mechanism where the system can present queries to the user which might aid them or make suggestions that they may then adopt um, to then run, run the um, query transformation process again. So it has the kind of, I guess, a spectrum of user involvement from um, basically giving them suggestions all the time and then directing where they want to go or it being a bit more automated uh, and being sort of process running further and then giving more of the final result to the person. Um, and I think that's important to have that um, variability in terms of how much involvement people want to have in the process or not. Um, but certainly this is a t technology where really you have to, um, from a research perspective, think quite carefully about how people formulate their information needs, how they go about, go about looking for information, and how they recognize when, it, when a, a piece of information is relevant to them. Um, so although there's a lot of machine learning done in the background, at the same time, you have to really understand that human computer interface um, in order to, you know, end up with something that, that actually works and is effective for people. Yep. Can I just add there, that work that um, Bevan's been doing uh, with uh, Bond University and the University of Queensland um, is actually part of our, our work as part of the NHMRC Centre for Research Excellence in Digital Health with Macquarie University. And um, uh, Paul Glasio down at Bond University has a vision for systematic reviews that they be generated in two minutes rather than taking two years to do. So <laughs> you can understand. Wow. Uh, I think that's right, isn't it, Bevan? That's his vision for what yeah. he'd like to get to? Yeah, yeah. He, he, he has a, I, I guess, uh, I would love to see sometime in the future the ability to basically press button and get a full set of all the evidence around a certain research question. Um, so, you know, how effective a mask for coronavirus, you know, a couple of minutes whizzing away in the background and boom, here's all the evidence that points towards this versus that. Um, and you can see how having that in a short time frame is so much more valuable than taking, you know, months and potentially years to gather that information. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so a good question there from Mark around CSRO partnering with digital health startup companies. Yes, and um, uh, we do. So, so happy to um, have those discussions and, and we do hook into some um, Commonwealth and CSRO funding as part of that as well uh, as, as a potential. Um, and then there's a question here from Ruben around research teams consulting when setting up the master data processes that underpin the source databases. And which international national standards do the projects use for quality assurance, quality control process, uh, purposes? So I think there's two, two, two questions there. One, Michael, do you want to just talk a little bit about um, use of standards in, in, in you know, electronic health capture? You talked about SNOMED, but maybe mention FHIR a little bit. Yes, sure. Um, so, yes, I mentioned SNOMED. SNOMED's an international standard for clinical terminology, and so that allows or um, consistent um, interoperable recording of procedures, diagnoses, and so forth. Um, and the Australian version of that um, adds in medications as well. Um, so medications um, do vary from um, country to country. We all have our own brands and, and strengths and so forth. Um, so that's another challenge. Um, but beyond that, there's the, um, the data standards and one of the key data, stand, data interchange standards in um, health IT is HL7's FHIR. Um, FHIR provides uh, a RESTful API for interacting with um, data and exchanging data um, on the wire, uh, JSON and XML. Um, it was originally designed for the interchange problem um, but it is increasingly being used as a native format. So um, people are starting to build systems around um, FHIR as a, as a storage format. Um, it's got um, pretty deep traction in some spaces. So for example, Google uses it in, um, as its internal common data format. 
um, um, converted to protocol buffers, but um, for all its health um, health data work, um, it exists inside the um, health app in your iPhone. If you have an iPhone, um, and so that's that's one of the key things that we're seeing being taken up, and, and it comes with some additional standards. Um, smart on fire and CDS hooks, which allow you to build um, apps that work um, consistently across different clinical platforms um, and that hook into the, the clinical workflow. And those are two of the key challenges, I think, um, harking back to the, uh, the first question about some of the impediments to deliver um, some of these um, technologies um, into clinical use. Cool. Thanks. Um, thanks, Michael. Um, there's a couple other questions coming in on the um, oh on the chat, and I see that, that uh, some of the guys are uh, answering those. Um, we're a few minutes away, Sophie, from finishing up. Did you want to do uh, break anything else around uh, around the AI hub before I think we're finishing it too? Um I think that's all. Yeah, that was fantastic. And yeah, there are some great questions, but obviously we run out of time. So, um, and even some about things, university students volunteering. So that would be very important. Um, we'll make sure we connect you in um, with David and, and team so we can get those questions answered, especially if you're interested in getting involved. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for that, David and team. That was really interesting and really informative. Um, fantastic. So uh, I think there'll be some more videos coming out via your LinkedIn. So if people are interested in learning more, they can check it out there. And those uh, links should be in the chat um, that were posted earlier in the session. So thanks a lot again, guys. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed this webinar. Um, we do have another one coming up on the 24th of September, and that will be um, a catch up with the winners of the Datathon. So if anyone was involved in the Datathon, um, you might be excited to hear about how the winning teams went. Even if not, it would be great for you to see um, how, you know, the outcomes of the Datathon and, and how valuable it was for these teams actually being able to take their idea just from a concept to actually starting to implement them um, into the clinical system. So um, that's on the 24th of September at 12 o'clock. So put it in your calendars. That'll be a great talk. Um, so yeah, pretty much all done. Any final comments, David? No, just to say thank you, everyone, for, for coming along today and, and um, uh, listening in. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed it. And uh, the, the um, reports available out there, we'll, we'll certainly be making more videos available over the next few weeks as well. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a good afternoon.